Picture of the week, front cover of the bulletin. And you know, if you listen to Christian contemporary music, there is a group called Jars of Clay. Okay, so this is definitely the connection that I would like us to make today. There is life and there is death. There is a life culture and there is a death culture. But before we get back to Corinthians, which is where I wanted to go ultimately, I want to remind us of the story of Abraham. And you're thinking, what on earth does Abraham... Well, Abraham shows up in the faith chapter of the Bible. So if you are, as I sang to you, Eric and I sang to you, you are those who know the story. You know it well. But here you've shown up again on a Sabbath morning because you want to hear it again. So I'm going to tell it to you again. Abraham had faith in God and did what he was asked to do even when his daddy didn't. I don't know about you, but my daddy did what God asked him to do and right up until he died. But he didn't get to do all that he wanted to do because he died a little younger than he thought he was going to die. Abraham loses his dad uh, uh, to, to a belief that he just couldn't go on. God comes to Abraham and he says, I need you to carry the torch. I need you to go on to the land that I will show you, the land that will become your destiny and, and, and the land that will become the place where your people will flourish and live and your people will be this example to the entire world and to the universe that this is what it's like when you put your faith in the God of creation. Now, I, I, I always mention that and you know that I always connect that to Revelation 14, 7, which says, fear God. Which God? The God who created heaven and earth. The creator God. It's very important at this juncture in our study, in our series, to understand that when we talk about God, when I talk about God, I'm talking about the God of the Bible, but specifically I'm talking about the God who made heaven and earth because I believe that the Adventist church has been raised up to, how shall we say, tell the world again that there is a God who called Abraham. A God who made the world, a God who got upset with the people on the world uh, and, and caused a huge uh, worldwide flood to wash the earth, saving only eight people who, de who, de who themselves determined to be saved, who themselves determined to listen to God's call. Uh, Bible scholars, quick, tell me, how many years did Noah preach that rain was coming? 120. Okay, so it's really not so bad that the Adventist church has been around for 150 plus saying, hey, there is a God who made this world and he's coming back to get all of those who want to live with him forever Whatever forever means, it just means life, okay? It means that you are not living death, you are living life. So Abram, he was Abram then, says yes, and he goes on this journey, and he finally reaches Canaan. Now, he brought his brother's son with him. His name was Lot. And Lot 
and, uh, and, and, and all his sheep and she shepherds. The, the, the larger family also went with, by the way. It wasn't just Abram and Sarai and, 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 and Lot. It was their extended family and their servants and their shepherds and, and, and their flocks and herds. They all moved together. So it was this massive group of people and animals. And they grew when they got to Canaan and they had to be separated. And we know the story from there, how Lot drifted closer and closer to the two big cities, the twin cities on the plain, known as Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, the, in those days, they weren't uh, a, a signboard for hellfire, okay? Today, because of the history that we know, the biblical history that we know, we, we realize that these two cities uh, uh, had become, uh, how shall we say, oriented towards not fearing the God of creation. And so as Lot moves closer, because, you know, when he and his uncle and their shepherds had a disagreement, Abram gave him the opportunity to choose where he wanted to graze his sheep. We're talking economy here. We're talking uh, the economy of the day was, was sheep. Sheep. And so it was very important. You want to live, you want to have a good life, uh, you, you know, you want to live the, the Canaanite dream, shall we say. And, and, and so you have the separation that takes place, and Abram chooses the hills, more difficult place to, to graze your sheep. Lot chooses the easy place, but it moves him closer and closer to town ever Wonder where the English phrase townhouse comes from? Well, that was back in the landed gentry days of England where you had a country home and a townhouse. Didn't live in both at the same time, but when you had dealings in town, you could have a place to stay. It was what you did if you were uh, the moneyed part of the people. And slowly but surely, he drifts, he drifts into town, till finally he is part of the people that are going to be extinguished, and the warning is given to Abram that this is going to happen, and he starts that bargaining process. If you know the, you, you know the story, and, and I, I just have one question for Abram in the story. How come he didn't bargain down to just one? Would God have said, no, I'm not going to burn down Sodom and Gomorrah if there was just one person. But he gets down to ten. He, he probably loses his nerve, his bargaining nerve at that point. And he says, if there's ten, and the angel that's talking, yes, if there are ten people, then we're not going to do it. But do you, do you feel the heart of God even as he, <clears throat> as he is bargaining with Abram at this moment? He does not want to do this. No matter who the people are, they are his creatures. They are his people. He does not want to destroy them. And Abram knows this. That's why he's even bargaining with God. He, he is playing upon God's character, upon God's actual uh, way of dealing with humanity. He trusts this God because he knows him and has faith in him. The, the, the rest of the story is, is actually uh, quite horrific. Because we are talking, we are talking, the Bible uh, uh, says that, that fire fell from heaven. Archaeologists are fairly sure, don't know for sure, that the remains of these two cities may just lie underneath the salt sea, the dead sea. We're going to find out, maybe, if time lasts, because between the times that I went to Israel as a, uh, a student missionary to teach English over there and the time that I went uh, with pastors most recently in 2012 with the British Columbia Conference, 
the distance between uh, where the buildings are where you can change to uh, enjoy swimming in the Dead Sea and the actual shore of the Dead Sea have changed dramatically. It's now over a kilometer, maybe more like a mile from where the beach used to be in the late 80s, early 90s and where the beach is today the salt sea is shrinking. And you say, well, why is that happening? Well, there's evaporation, and there's also the fact that so much of the water that is coming from Lake Galilee down the Jordan River, which feeds, is the only thing that feeds the Dead Sea, so much of that water is being used by agriculture that hardly any of that water is now reaching the Dead Sea. Do we know anything about that in California? Yes, I think we do. I think we do. All those signs when you're driving up Highway 5, is it wrong to grow food with water? Farmers are pleading, pleading with us not to cut off their water supply, telling us, of course, that they're growing food for us and we should let them have the water. And I'm saying, yes, they, we, we probably should, except that a lot of the things that we buy don't come from what they're, what they're har harvesting for us, what they're farming for us, which is just an interesting little factoid for you today that over 50% of the food that Americans uh, consume today, over 50% comes from outside of the United States. So thank you, Walmart. That, that was kind of you to bring those tomatoes from I don't know where. Uh, somewhere else, just not, not from the United States. This is a horrific story, and, and, and I'm, for the sake of uh, the G-rated audience that we have, we'll, we'll leave it right here, but it is, it is I think, in, instructive for us to, to, to begin our conversation today about uh, the life that we are being asked to live in this world at this time by remembering what happened to Abraham and his family as they obeyed God, did what he wanted them to do by faith, listened to him, then ended up in the place where he wanted them to be and where he does not impose his will upon his family, namely Lot, and then uh, has to watch while Lot slowly creeps closer and closer to that economic center that had hugely negative influences as part of it. I think it's something that, that we can say is a very stark contrast. The way that Abram lives would probably be considered a life culture, a life-connected culture. He is connected to the God of creation. He talks to him. He listens to him. He does what he says to do. And that Lot could easily represent those in this world who also have heard from God, also have watched what God has done, and yet are in the midst of, in the flow of the economy of this world, and are slowly being drawn inexorably towards the center of that, until they find themselves, like so many of us, maybe like all of us, dwelling, dwelling in the midst of a culture that has no reference maybe I can just say it bluntly like this, has, has no reference to God as to why it does what it does, but is completely self-absorbed and has only reference to whatever is good for us now. And we say, wow, I wish, I wish our tax dollars could make better roads, right? Right? You know, that's what they're intended for, and that's what we hope will happen. And, and I, you know, I'm connected to, to people who work on roads uh, somewhat, 
And uh, you know, that's, what gets, that's what happens with a lot of your tax dollars. They, they make our lives better. So I'm, I am going to say that when things are working as intended, your tax dollars, my tax dollars in this economy go towards making life the, the, the fantastic life that it is here in Southern California. The life that so many around the world on television because of movies and, and shows see in us and see us enjoying and say in their heart of hearts when they're in North Africa or India or in the Punjab or some other place on planet Earth, they look at what we have and they say, I want that. I want that. I wish I could have that. wish I could live there. We are blessed. I recognize that, and I want to say it is a blessing to live in such an incredible place on planet Earth. The protection that we enjoy, the, 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 the relative safety that we enjoy that was interrupted on, on Halloween night for me with a thudding on the side of my house, which I now uh, am thoroughly believing was a bobcat. I don't want to believe anything else. But, yes, at 1 o'clock in the morning uh, on, on, on Halloween night, there was a bam, bam, bam on the side of my house. And I live in a gated community with the gate, or actually the wall right next to me, so I don't know what happened. We looked around, there was nothing that happened, and the, the dog didn't wake up, so she didn't smell anything, hear anything. So it was strange. That's a, that's a strange thing to have happen in Santa Clarita, right? Because we expect safety at night. I don't know if you have ever had the chance because you were not able to sleep in the middle of the night, but just go out of your house sometime. Just walk out in the middle of the street in front of your house sometime and see how calm it is. Do you realize what a privilege it is to live in a place where you can have that and know that you are safe, that people are watching over you all night long? It's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. So I, I don't denigrate that at all. However, I do, know, I do know that the economy in which we live in California today is not oriented necessarily towards the goodness and graciousness that comes from our Heavenly Father. If it were, then you know, maybe we wouldn't have so many people that are homeless. If it were, then maybe we wouldn't have companies saying, uh, you, you don't measure up. I'm just going to go find some other person to do this job because I don't like the way you do it, and I'm just throwing you away because you don't really matter to me. I don't really care about your family, and, and, and you're fired. In other words, attitudes in society today uh, do abound where it, it, it is uh, not as cooperative maybe as you would think that uh, a place would be that, that puts the principles of God first. Okay, so the assumption that those are the principles by which this economy is operating might not be the assumptions that we can take for granted in this world. I'm going to believe, because of where this country has come from, that we do have the ability to trust most of what happens as being for our good. Would you agree with that? I mean, here we are. Here we are. We're going to be faced with opportunities to choose, which is what I'm going to talk about next, and we are going to have the opportunity to choose to put people in places of influence and or decision-making that will help us to have the kind of society that would be good for most of us. I mean, if you're a brigand and a felon, you, you don't like individuals who want to enforce the law. Let's just put it this way. If you are a selfish person you're not really going to like anything that anybody else likes, right? That's the definition of a selfish person. So understand that the hope that springs up in my heart as a, as a voter in California with this 
election coming up very shortly is that I will have the opportunity to assist individuals who would like to assist the majority of us or all of us in some way that is good and in some way that will benefit, I'm hoping, the kingdom of heaven. But hey, back to Abraham and Lot. Life and death. This last week, there were a lot of zombies that I saw in front yards. I did not attend any parties where there were people dressed as zombies. However, I, I, I promised several people that I would be preaching about zombies today, so here it is. Could it be, could it be that if you are not attached to the life giver, that you are in fact the walking dead. Let that sink in for a moment. Jesus says, I have come that you may have life. And if people say, no thanks, what happens? We were in class this morning and we were studying Revelation 22, 12. Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. Each one to, according to what they have done. According, uh, King James says, according to their works. And we decided that your works are not what save you. We believe we are saved like Abraham by faith alone in Christ alone. But that when you're in that relationship, there are things that you will do. As a result, there are works that you will do. And those works are evidence, according to James. Martin Luther hated James. You know why? Because it just broke up his, his, little, his little mantra, saved by faith alone in Christ. But guess what? When we have faith in Jesus and we have this relationship with Jesus, there is going to be a way in which we live because of him and the things that we do, we do because of him. They are inspired by him. And we then carry out what he has asked us to be, our purpose in life, which is to be witnesses to what it is to have Jesus in our life. Does that make sense? I, I, I don't want to be preaching heresy here, so stop me and say, oh, pastor, that, that, that just isn't right. But I believe that it's that simple. And so in Revelation 22, 12, it says that Jesus is coming quickly, amen? He's coming quickly and his reward is with him and he is going to give every single human being the reward they most desire. How do we know what they desire? How do we know what's on their Christmas list? Isn't that a wonderful analogy? We all have a Christmas list and Jesus is the one who's going to give us the, the Christmas present. What's on your list? Not what's in your wallet. What's on your list? If on your list is life, eternal life, and that because you have chosen that, you have lived your life in association with the life giver, then my friends, you are part of, even now, we believe. This is a big thing. I've talked to three people about this in different parts of the world to, this week. We need to realize that when you accept Jesus as your personal Savior, your eternal life begins then. So if you did it five minutes ago and said, yes, Jesus, I want to be part of your kingdom. I want you to be the Lord of my life. If you have said that five minutes ago, five minutes ago, your eternal life began. Okay, so what about the second coming? Well, the second coming, my friends, is, is when Jesus does the big change so that we can all live in his presence physically and continue our eternal life. That's all it is. Okay? He has promised that we will all be changed in the twinkling of an eye and that we will then be able to... So that means 
that you being here this morning, you singing praises to the God of heaven and earth, the God who created you, you doing that today is part of your eternity. There's no waiting for eternity. This, my friends, is, is, is something we live now. Or we can. Or we can just be hypocrites and say we are and really not be. Horrible, horrible to think that, that anyone in the hearing of my voice would be part of the group that says, ah, God, I went to church this week. Uh, could you bless me, please? Sort of like, here's my 50 cents. I put it in. Candy bar, please? Really? You really think that's how it works? I, I, I certainly hope not, because that is not how he hopes that you think that it works. He is hoping that you realize that he wants a relationship with you that begins and, and is continuous forever. And that, that, that there's, there's not a break in it. There, there's, 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 there's this thing that happens now and goes on forever. Uh, why, why, would we, why would we not want that, you see? That's the question that I have for myself and for others who don't seem to get it in some respects, don't seem to understand that this is really what Jesus wants for us. And why, when he comes back, the reward, the Christmas present that he gives us exactly matches what we want. Really helps me, especially with uh, my young friends in the millennial generation who see this end, end scenario that we preach, uh, this fiery end to the world, this burning up of so many people. They, they, they think, what kind of genocidal God do you serve? I say, no. What kind of people are you walking around with who are actually asking God to end their lives? Because as we began, there is a life culture and a, and a death culture. And if you are asking, if you are asking right now for God to not be in your life, if you are maybe associated with people who are keeping God at arm's length, they are basically saying, no thank you. They're saying, I choose, I choose to do it my way. In the Bible, my friends, is very clear about that, that there is a way that seems right to us as human beings, and the end thereof is death. So then if you do the backwards logic on that, people who are choosing to do life without God are choosing death and therefore are zombies. They are the walking dead. It's a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing to think of. It really is. I was watching, I was watching one of these nature movies recently and there's, an, there's a beetle in, in Asia that has toxins on it. If you even touch it, it, it causes terrible uh, uh, skin burns and, 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 and it's, it's hurting a lot of people. This one little baby got got it on her and her skin, her skin looked like that of an 80 year old as a result. It was, it, 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 it gets to the place with certain individuals where they, the skin actually dies. This is, this is the kind of toxins that, that some of these little beetles have in this, in this world. We, we go, ugh, that's terrible. I'm only going to use a pair of tongs to touch. That's what they say. Don't even touch. Don't even touch the clothes that somebody has had this beetle on because you might get some of it on you. It's that toxic. What if we, what if we thought of the death culture in our world today as, as being that toxic? That, that getting it on us, getting it on us, it, 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 it would, would cause us to, to begin to die, would cause pain. Okay, now you're saying, Pastor, you, 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 you've gone to meddling now. <laughs> yes, well, 
I, I cannot help this because you have this text that, we, that, that, that Kit read for us. You have this text that basically it, it was also Paul's problem when he came to people in his day. They came and said, you know what? The culture that you're living in chooses death. It chooses not to be in association with the God of creation. When you follow that culture, you are participating, you are headed in that direction. Please don't listen to that. Instead, he says, remember when we came, we brought you uh, the knowledge of the life giver. We brought you the knowledge that in connection with Christ, when you have his power and his strength, living in you, that you then are living the kingdom of heaven life. So I'm going to close with this. Yes, it's politics. Yes. When you think of the larger sphere in which we live today and the fact that we will have the opportunity as, as red-blooded Americans to go to the polls, Please be praying for two things, yourself and your family and for the country. And here's why. Because if you, like me, have accepted Jesus into your life and he is the Lord of your life, he is the ultimate authority in your life, then you have chosen to live as part of the life culture. I believe that if you're living as part of the life culture, you're going to want to know what the principles of the kingdom of heaven are. That's what we're busy doing in this series, is going through what it is to be knowledgeable of the kingdom of heaven and to live according to the principles of the kingdom of heaven, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though we are surrounded by a culture that is disconnected, deliberately disconnected from the life giver. And as much as we would like to sugarcoat it, the end thereof, the Bible says, is death. It will be seen ultimately that the direction away from life is well, I like to call it not life. And Jesus comes and he says, please, choose, choose life. I've come that you may have life. And as I heard someone say, have it more abundantly. And so if you've, if you've chosen that, as you go to the polls, and I, I, I strongly want to support those who say, let's all go to the polls, let's all vote Let's all be knowledgeable about the fact that first and foremost, our allegiance is to the God of creation. The God who made heaven and earth. The God who is wanting us as a community of faith, along with many other God-fearing Americans, to create a culture that helps more and more and more and more people come to an understanding of the love that God has for all people. Knowing that as a general spiritual principle, please pray about that as you go to the polls. That's what I'm going to do. Okay, I'm, I, 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 I'm, I actually don't have allegiance to many or any political group I have allegiance to God and I'm asking him I'm asking him about the issues I'm asking him about the people who who want to take a stand or say they're going to take a stand on a particular issue I'm asking him whether or not that is the right person because let's face it this is the God who chose Saul and chose David and chose other government leaders who yeah, did so-so or not so good? Have you ever read Kings? Some of them get about this long. They get about 
three or four verses that say, and he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and he died. So do you think that we have a God who doesn't know who we are, who doesn't know how we act, and who doesn't know that there are some times when we are not going to be as, as happy about doing what he wants? Yes, we know that. Do I, do I believe that, that whoever gets elected is going to be the, the exact perfect person that will listen to God every single minute of the day? No. But do I also believe that God talks to our leaders in our country? Yes. Does he want to have influence in their life? Yes. Does he want a, a place in America today where there is more opportunity for people to get connected to him and his kingdom? Yes. So listen to the Spirit. Listen to the Holy Spirit and, and ask him what he would like you to do. Because you see, there really are only two cultures in this world. The life culture and the death culture. And we have an opportunity, I believe, as a group of believers in Jesus to help spread the opportunity to be a part of the life culture. Go be good citizens of not only the kingdom of heaven, but of these blessed United States of America. Amen.